Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Friday, October 7th marks the 15th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan. Until now, this war has cost the lives of 90,000 Afghans, over 2,300 U.S. soldiers, and cost the U.S. taxpayer at least $850 billion, of which $110 billion were for the country's reconstruction. This is about the same amount that the U.S. spent on the Marshall Plan for rebuilding Europe after World War II. The fight against the Taliban continues, and now it is estimated that up to a third of Afghanistan's territory is again under Taliban control. Joining us from Los Angeles to talk about the longest war in U.S. history is Sonali Kolhatkar. She is founding director of the U.S.-based solidarity organization Afghan Women's Mission, which raises funds for social and political women-led projects in Afghanistan, and she is the host of Rising Up with Sonali, which is broadcast on Free Speech TV and Pacifica radio stations. Thanks for being with us, Sonali. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the legacy of the Afghanistan war under President Obama. The 15th year marks the last full year of the war under his administration. When he first ran for office in 2008, he called Afghanistan, quote, the right battlefield, contrasting it with the war in Iraq. And this June, Obama announced that 8,400 U.S. troops will remain in the country through the end of his presidency, reversing an earlier commitment to withdraw all U.S. troops by the end of 2016. What is your take on Obama's legacy when it comes to the war in Afghanistan and Somali? Well, you know, I think a lot of us have this impression of the president as having run on a mildly anti-war platform. And indeed, when President Obama ran for office in 2008, he promised to end the Iraq war. Uh, he sort of kept that promise and then broke it, of course, given what's happened with the Islamic State. But on Afghanistan, he was very clear right from the start that that would be the battle that he would escalate. And this is not surprising. Democrats have often, um, you know, sort of worried about appearing soft on terrorism. And uh, so he promised to escalate the Afghan war. That is exactly what he did. Uh, he promised a surge in troops. And it was thought, uh, I think, very naively that the U.S. could wrap that war up into a nice, neat package, leave the country in the, in you know, uh, under the um, auspices of the this newly formed Afghan government, make sure the warlords had power-sharing deals that they could live with and then walk away um, with the Taliban just somehow magically disappeared. Of course, none of that happened. President Obama continued the war. Um, he, you know, had very little choice short of saying, um, you know, uh, we give up and we've lost the war, so we're walking away. In many ways, Afghanistan is our modern Vietnam war. Um, what's really sad is how little attention Afghanistan has gotten compared to what Vietnam got and what uh, the Iraq war had gotten and continues to get. Hmm. Well, I want to get back to that later. But first, um, a few weeks ago, um, the president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, signed an amnesty for Gobuddin Hekmatyar and his organization. And many organizations, uh, many Afghans were outraged because Hekmatyar is considered to be one of the most ruthless warlords in Afghanistan, Afghanistan who had earned the nickname the Butcher of Kabul. And now, at a recent aid conference in Brussels, John Kerry said that this amnesty deal was a model that the Taliban should follow. Is this, do you think that this is the right way to end the war in, uh, with the Taliban? Or what would you say needs to happen for peace in Afghanistan? Well, right from the start of the U.S. war, um, we've had these very weird double standards with the, with the Taliban. We've been fighting in the, them on the battleground, and we've been talking about bringing them to the table, if you will, to be part of any peace process. For years, the United States has made uh, sort of um, behind-the-scenes overtures to the Taliban, um, you know, uh, which just doesn't make sense if they're considered the enemy. Um, if you want to have a diplomatic end to the war, you have a diplomatic end to the war and you start talking with them right away. Uh, but the U.S. has been fighting them and then they've been talking about um, doing some kind of peace deal with them. Peace deals have never really worked out. And then this particular deal with Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, which was considered the first, um, you know, post- um, uh, invasion, first um, modern Afghan peace deal with a warlord um, has been hailed as something great for the country. But in fact, it is one of the worst things that the U.S. could have backed. The U.S. has consistently empowered warlords in Afghanistan, and Gulbuddin Hekmatyar has been one of the worst warlords in basically shaking his hand 
giving him political immunity, which is what this deal does, providing security for him at Afghan expense, which is what this deal does. We're doing exactly what we've always done. How are the results going to be any different? Gulbuddin Hekmatyar has the blood of thousands of Afghans on his hand. He has no allegiance to anybody. He has at various points fought the Soviets for the United States, fought the United States uh, alongside the Soviets, fought the Taliban alongside the U.S., fought the U.S. alongside the Taliban. Basically, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, you know, works for nobody but himself. He was the recipient of the largest amount of U.S. aid uh, during the, the war against the Soviet. He has gotten rich from U.S. taxpayer dollars, and he continues to do that. And this is a war criminal. Now his future has been assured. He can never be prosecuted for any of the crimes he's committed under this deal. And this is what they want to replicate for the Taliban and for other warlords. I mean, if peace and, and democracy in Afghanistan means an absolute you know, lack of justice, um, then you're not going to ever have any movement forward, any progression, because Afghans haven't forgotten uh, the crimes that have been uh, done to them. Afghans ha are suffering and continue to suffer. All you, if, if all you do is reward warlords for being warlords, you're going to get more warlords, more impunity. Hmm. Another development that's recently happened, actually earlier this week, uh, the European Union pledged to provide Afghanistan with $3.7 billion per year for the next four years. And at the same time, they also announced that they're potentially uh, going to send tens of thousands of Af Afghans who had uh, their refugee application denied um, to send them back to Afghanistan. Uh, what effect do you think these measures, the aid and the refugees, will have on the country now? I mean, this is basically what the international community has done to Afghanistan for decades. Afghanistan is always everybody else's problem but our own, even as we have interfered in that country. In terms of Europe, Afghanistan was the country that essentially gave NATO its new lease on life. Um, after the September 11th attacks, Afghanistan was briefly under UN auspices, and then NATO famously and ceremoniously took over, because, of course, after the end of the Cold War, NATO didn't really have any reason to continue to exist. Getting involved in the uh, in the Afghanistan war gave NATO, which is essentially Europe's uh, war fighting arm alongside the US, uh, gave it a reason to continue to exist. So NATO forces, aka European and US forces, have been actively engaged in the war in Afghanistan for the past uh, decade or more. And the country remains dangerous. In July of this year, 80 people were killed in a single attack in Kabul, the capital, which is supposed to be the safest city in Afghanistan, and the Islamic State took credit for that. So there's a new actor in Afghanistan now. Hundreds of people injured. You know, when we heard about the, the attacks in Paris, the world mourned, but the world, you know, usually uh, doesn't pay attention when such attacks, similar attacks happen in countries like Afghanistan. That's the violence that Europe is uh, pushing these refugees to. And it's not, of course, just Europe's problem. The US U.S. should be taking in far more Afghan refugees than it does, given uh, the role of the United States after 9-11 in Afghanistan. All they're doing is, is condemning these refugees who have left because of desperate circumstances to a life of either poverty or violence or both. One of the main reasons that the U.S. is even fighting in Afghanistan is, of course, to prevent the Taliban from governing the country again. And you, uh, Sonali, have worked with Afghan women quite a bit. Would you say now the situation of women uh, for women is better in, uh, in Afghanistan now than it was under the Taliban, or how has it changed? If you live in Kabul, if you're a woman who lives in Kabul, if you've had access to education, if you come from a family that has had the money to send you to a good school that is liberal enough to let you live your life, you might be able to have a much better life in Afghanistan today than you might have had under Taliban rule. But that is a sort of narrow category of women that can live a halfway normal life in Afghanistan. For the vast majority of the rest of Afghan women, maternal mortality rates, education and literacy rates, um, and uh, lack of access to rates of, of uh, employment, rates of uh, access to health care remain absolutely abominable. Uh, women still continue to suffer with, you know, from, so, from some very, very terrible um, systemic issues in Afghanistan, such as child marriage, such as being stoned or even imprisoned for so-called honor crimes. There was this um, absolutely horrific, nightmarish assault that took place on a young uh, woman, a mother, 27-year-old woman named Farqa, uh, 
last December, so less than a year ago, in broad daylight, she was basically lynched by a mob of men with Afghan police watching. Um, you know, they sort of half-heartedly tried to protect her from the mob. She was accused of uh, accused of uh, burning a Quran, which she never did, and even if she had, uh, wouldn't have justified what happened to her. She was literally beaten to death in front of all these men. It was videotaped. It was it made the news. Uh, but that is basically what Afghan women experience today. And all of this talk that we heard about the U.S. going in um, in 2001 to liberate Afghan women, the women I work with never believed that. Um, the women I work with are members of the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, or RAWA, which is the oldest uh, feminist women's political organization in Afghanistan. And right from the start, they saw themselves and women as being oppressed by the twin forces of homegrown fundamentalism and Western imperialism, both of which they see as sort of in bed with one another. They wanted to be liberated um, from both Western imperialism and homegrown fundamentalism, and they made it very clear that the, the liberation could never come through bombs and from the outside, that it can only come from within. And so they've always rejected U.S. interference um, in their affairs. And today, um, 15 years later, Afghan women, you know, 15 years later, are still waiting for the much promised liberation uh, that George W. Bush and Laura Bush um, uh, made claims about. And finally, the war in Afghanistan has hardly been mentioned in the U.S. presidential campaign, as you mentioned earlier. Do you expect any changes with regard to U.S. policy in Afghanistan under Clinton or Trump presidency um, beginning in 2017? No. In fact, um, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans have always agreed on Afghanistan. It's been one of the uh, few issues on foreign policy that they've been in very, you know, very much lockstep. They might sometimes disagree on some of the details, but they've always been um, very much in agreement. A lot of liberals uh, and Democrats were supportive of the war in Afghanistan all the way back in 2001. Uh, some have sort of changed their tune on it, uh, but nobody, you know, but many of them don't even speak out against it anymore. There's just silence. Um, in, in 2006, my partner Jim Ingalls and I wrote a book called Bleeding Afghanistan, Washington Warlords and the Propaganda of Silence. And that last phrase, the propaganda of silence, is something Afghanistan has always suffered under, literally a lack of attention from uh, our media here so that both parties, Democrats and Republicans, um, can, uh, can you know wantonly throw soldiers, bombs and uh, waste dollars into Afghanistan. Afghanistan. There's been a continuum politically from the presidency of George W. Bush through the presidency of Obama on Afghanistan, whereas on other issues they differed quite significantly. I highly doubt that under Trump or Clinton um, we would see very, uh, you know, any serious difference on Afghanistan. Uh, Clinton, this, who's supposed to be the liberal of the two on this issue, has not promised at all to end the war in Afghanistan. She hasn't even been asked to, um, you know, she hasn't even been sort of questioned about it. Like, no one's even holding her accountable um, or Obama accountable around the war in Afghanistan, except for, you know, the staunch sort of left anti-war movements in the U.S. So, so to both Democrats and Republicans, Afghanistan is a free pass that they've gotten, and they'll continue to do it until the U.S. anti-war movement broadens speaks out vocally against the war in Afghanistan and makes enough noise to force our government to do something just about Afghanistan, uh, even minimally just leaving the country uh, instead of continuing it endlessly. I hope, Gregory, that you and I, in two, three, four, five years, aren't having the same conversation, say, on the 20th anniversary of the Afghan war. This is the longest war the U.S. has ever waged, and it's far past time that it ends. All right. Well, we'll definitely be keeping our attention on, on what's going on there and uh, also what the policy is towards Afghanistan. So uh, I've been talking to Sonali Kolhatkar of the Afghan Women's Mission. Thanks for joining us on The Real News today, Sonali. It's my pleasure, and thank you for covering this undercovered issue. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.